Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining How to Run Your Gaming Content online. My name is Tara Clapper, and I am the one presenting this seminar today. If all of you could do me a favor and open the chat function in Zoom, that would be great. Uh, to get to that on your computer, you can go down to the bottom of the Zoom program and click chat, and it will open a little chat box. I see some people in there already saying good morning, and that's great to see. Thank you so much to the, to the West Coast people for waking up so early to join this presentation. I really appreciate it. So uh, I'll be asking a couple questions of you throughout this presentation so I can better tailor the experience towards you and your needs when it comes to running gaming content online. And I would greatly appreciate some responses in that chat box when I ask questions. So good morning and again, welcome. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am and why I'm remotely qualified to give this presentation and then we will uh, get started. So again, my name is Tara Clapper and I run the Geek Initiative LARPs. I have 13 years of experience playing live action role playing games. I'm also a tabletop role playing game uh, player and um, I've been LARP running LARPs online for a few years. And what happened was a few years ago, I lost my job and all of my friends said, hey, we want to support you. We love your storytelling. Let's let me give you money to run LARPs. And I said, well, LARPs require a venue and insurance, all the stuff you don't have money for when you've just lost your job. Right. So I decided, hey, I could do this online. And that's sort of the genesis for me running live action games online and obviously with the pandemic it has become uh, even more valuable to be able to run games online and that's what i've been doing so um, i have contributed to a lot of published tabletop role-playing games including the uh, recent snow haven i've done a lot of proofreading and editing work on tabletop games and you can see me play tabletop regularly on the Penny for a Tail channel on Twitch. I specialize in storytelling adventures, so I'm not really much of a mechanics person. Um, I am definitely more of a story person, which works a little bit better on virtual platforms. Uh, but there are some tools we're going to go over that you could use to run um, higher mechanics games online. I also run LARP Mentor at LARPmentor.com and Chariot LARP at ChariotLARP.com. LARP Mentor is my little consulting arm of what I do where I can help people take their games online. Uh, Chariot LARP is my weekend long, massive multiplayer online live action experience happening at the end of the month. And I'll be talking a little bit more about Chariot as an example throughout this because it's a sci-fi game and that makes it ideal for an online experience because the players and the characters are using the same software. So sometimes when we're playing uh, live action games, especially online, uh, we're pretending we're in the same room or we're pretending it's 1800. But with a sci-fi game, it's a little bit easier because we're both, the characters and the players are both using the same technology. I also have a marketing background. I started out in publishing, doing self-publishing at a company called Ex Libris in Philadelphia. And um, I transitioned that into marketing because publishing is a tough biz. And I've been applying a lot of my marketing experience to running games online. A lot of it is about community management when you talk about running a successful game online and a lot of my marketing stuff comes into play there. So we're going to talk about running various types of role playing games uh, and a little bit about board games too for online play. I'm also going to get a little bit about into a little bit about monetizing and streaming them if people are interested in that because my part time job is my business of running these games online and we'll get into the community management side as well. So in the chat, I would like to know what types of games you are actually looking to run online. Uh, tabletop role playing games, LARPs, let me know because uh, I'm going to tailor this presentation to you. 
and I definitely run and participate in both kinds. A lot of tabletops, fantasy LARP, okay. Cool, cool, D&D, &D, fiasco, great. And I see a couple questions in there too about how you would run a LARP online. It's very interesting because even people who are experienced players and even designers of live action games are confused about how to do that. Is it still live if it's online? And the answer is yes, it's actually really accessible and I consider it to be kind of ableist to say that it's not really LARP, right, if you're running it online. Because the only difference is you're using a platform like Zoom to run it online, right? So it's still a character talking to a character versus a narrative, which is more like a tabletop game usually where you're describing my character walks through the hallway. Um, a LARP is usually just a character talking to a character. So, uh, so it is possible to do and I'm happy to talk about that more. So it looks like most of you are running tabletops or wanting to learn how to do that so I can focus on that and also toss a little bit about LARPs in and you'll hear my own games as examples and they are LARPs too. So reasons it's helpful to run online. Obviously, you know, connectivity, the current pandemic situation makes it very hard to get together in real life and play. It is more accessible to people who cannot physically attend a game or maybe they can't physically do like a high combat game. And it's usually more financially accessible. The cost of running a game online is considerably lower than it is running one in person when you're talking about a LARP. Um, and it's just much easier to do online. And when you're monetizing, it's nice because your overhead is so low and you can still make money on it, but uh, you're not asking your players to pay a lot. So it's also more financially accessible as well. And if you're comping someone in, to uh, help them out with their financial difficulty. It's like you're just giving labor. You're not really giving resources like you would at a, an in-person LARP. So you're not covering their meals and their lodging and all that stuff. So it makes it more accessible and easier to comp people in too. Other reasons people run games online, the technology is available, right? So uh, that's pretty easy. It's for entertainment. We can do this for fun. Uh, you don't have to monetize everything. You can also demo your games this way by recording presentations, recording your gaming or streaming it. And you can monetize it, as I've said before, by uh, asking people to pay or to tip you when you run. You can also keep your community engaged, which as I've said a couple times is the biggest part of this really. It's keeping and it's also a big challenge we're going to talk about challenges too in doing this and i'm going to ask you guys about that soon it's very challenging to keep a community engaged it's even more challenging to do during a pandemic when people are worried about their jobs and their health so it's such a big part of it and they also depend on the availability of games you know i work at home normally all the time so doing that during the pandemic isn't new, but I can tell you from experience that when you work at home all the time, if you don't have something that gives you a routine, it's extremely hard to engage. So for example, when I pet sit, it's a lot easier for me to have a routine because the dog needs to get up and go out, you know, a few times a day and eats at a certain time of day. But when I don't have that, it's tough. So a lot of people are even depending on these games to establish a kind of routine. You know, just like in real life, if you have D&D &D every Saturday night, doing that online becomes even more important because it's the routine. So you wanna be reliable and you wanna keep people engaged throughout the week. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about in terms of how to do this is organizing players. Some of you might be a little young for this, but for those of you who aren't, think about the good old days. The first time you became really engaged in like a World of Warcraft guild, or maybe it was the first time you got really into a text-based role-playing game on AOL, right? I was definitely one of those people in, in those chat rooms. You probably quickly learned that if you were 
a player, it was really important to you to have organization and community management, right? If you're doing a raid together in WoW, somebody's got to organize all of that. And, um, and that's, that's important. So if you're managing this stuff, uh, scheduling and everything like that is really important. And there are some tools you can use. You can have a simple email list for it. You can use Discord. And of course, there's a tool called Doodle, which enables you to basically set up sometimes you're available and then other people can uh, go in and check off when they're available and then you can pick a time. It makes scheduling a lot easier. Of course, you can also use tools like Zoom, which we're using right here. The number one thing that I think you should pay for if you're regularly running experiences online is Zoom. I have a paid Zoom account for running my games and it just makes everything so much easier. It can save recordings. When it creates invitations, it lets you add them to your calendar. It just makes a, a I don't want to say a seamless experience, but it makes everything a lot easier if you're only managing like five or six players at a time. Of course, there's Roll20, which most people know about, which allows you to see what each other are rolling and share various materials online and look at maps together. You can even run soundtracks on Roll20, which players can adjust the volume themselves so you don't have those volume issues like you would have on Zoom or other platforms. You can also share your screen uh, and use other display tools. Uh, I like to use two monitors. So right now I actually have my laptop computer and two monitors behind it because I was having some technical difficulties this morning. So having a backup is good. But uh, two monitors is great because I'm usually role playing on one of them on Zoom and then uh, and answering questions there. And then also you can, you know, do some research on the other side or add notes or you know as a gm i'm looking at character sheets too uh john michael huang says would recommend sirenscape online for audio thank you for that suggestion uh, that sounds great so before we get more into community management i want to know what kind of challenges you have when it comes to running a game online we've already talked a little bit about scheduling but I know sometimes it's tough for people to find players. It's, you know, there's a learning curve with some of the technology. Let me know in the chat what kind of challenges you have when it comes to running a game online. And we're gonna talk about those because I've been doing this for a few years. So I sort of ironed out a lot of the, the issues and Zoom has helped me with that a lot. Uh, as somebody who monetizes games, I've, um used woocommerce on my wordpress site so that's helpful i'm going to give you a second to just kind of put in your challenges there there's a lot of great information in the chat ease of use for players so in tabletop games especially a lot of times people will do a session zero where you like create characters, you talk about your concepts, you maybe run a very small adventure or role play the party getting to know each other. In your session zero, when you're running a game online, use the session zero also to troubleshoot technology and to help your players access the technology. Because I'm seeing a lot of you are struggling with the tech or you're worried that your players aren't gonna be great with the tech. You can use your session zero just kind of build that in. You want to do sound checks, you know, your audio checks and stuff like that. Cross-platform issues, you have players that only have iPads. Yeah, that's important too, Brian. And that's one of the reasons I keep it simple, which is a little easier to do with LARP than tabletop. But, you know, if you just have an iPad, you can use Zoom or Google Hangouts. It's really all you're going to need for most of my live action games. And I actually have uh, a few couples that play and they share like a desktop computer at home. So one of them is in one room on an iPad and one of them is using the desktop. So that's important too. Um, I really appreciate those comments. More prep work. 
improvising with players. Yeah, I want to talk a bit about immersion, which applies to both tabletop and LARP. People have the general impression that because you're running something online, it can't be as immersive. And I've done my best to shatter that. And I've had people be very surprised. I've had people crying. I've had people um, just completely surprised at how immersive an online game can be. And there are a couple ways to do that. We talked about running music on Roll20. That can be useful. Sharing documents online can actually make a more uh, immersive experience. So if you're at a table, you know, in person and you're role playing and your characters come across a scroll, a really cool DM will hand them a physical copy of the scroll and say, this is what you find. Right. And that makes it so cool and so engaging. When you're role playing online, it's the same thing. But the cool thing about it is you can create some of those things on the fly. Super easy to open a Google Doc, type up some information, and then, you know, put it in a cool font and share it. Or while the player while the players have their characters off doing something, or you've given them an assignment or something like that, or a puzzle to figure out. Maybe you're in Canva, which you can find at canva.com, designing something cool to show them. So if you can have the skills to be a responsive GM, you can increase immersion. Also on Zoom, you can uh, use backgrounds. So if you're on your computer, there's a little spot for video on the bottom left, and there's an arrow next to where it says stop video. And if you click on that arrow, and click choose virtual background, you can actually change your background. Kind of cool. Um, the one game that I run called Lore, Live Online Raptor Experience, which is as ridiculous as it sounds, Lore comes with backgrounds. So players can use them. They can also change backgrounds throughout the game. So we might be starting in an office on this dinosaur island. But then we go into a forest and people are like running through the forest. It's very cheesy, but it works. And it also works with more serious games. Keep in mind, not every player is going to have the capability to change backgrounds on Zoom. You don't want to make them feel bad about it, but it's something cool you can do to make it immersive. So I'm going to go ahead and, and look through some more of these challenge. Prep time with Roll20 is a big challenge. I agree. Um, there are some other tools you can use if you prefer just like draw your battle maps uh, that might be able to help you. Um, keeping players engaged when it's not their turn. That's also a big one, especially online. So like a lot of people will have their phones and they'll look down and they're, it's like seen as like less impolite to be distracted by your phone and your pets and your kids when you're role playing online than it is when you're role playing in person. And hey, we wanna be accessible. That's awesome that people can be minding their kids, but also playing, playing your game, right? That's pretty cool. However, you wanna keep them engaged. So if you notice throughout this presentation, I've been asking you questions every so often, which requires your engagement to respond. So have some questions prepped for your characters or have your NPCs ready to ask each and every character a question so you're engaging them all at a certain point in time. If you're really into role play, the other cool thing you can do is have your character keep a journal and ask them to write certain information down at certain times. I'm not just saying have somebody be the note taker, which is always important, but have them kind of explore different sides of themselves through the character have the player learn about themselves by asking them questions. Have some, you know, really exploratory stuff they have to get through to proceed with the quest. Make it about self-discovery and about learning together. And again, use your session zero to encourage role play. And don't just have your characters like show up in a tavern and not sure how they know each other. You want to like have those connections built in. One thing I've learned in LARP that I've translated to tabletop is having 
those character connections in the backstory. So even if your your players are creating their own characters, have a time where you meet and have them create relationships between those characters before you play. And you know, if they're not as confident role players, you can base it off of their real life interactions that you observe. So GMing, especially online, is part observation there. So Nick says, if you're communicating over Discord, you can set yourself up that voice priority. That's a great tip. The other thing is, Discord is cool because you can have various rooms set up, like various different channels on your server, and people can go in and out of different rooms. But the video on Discord, what it is on Zoom, it kind of cuts you off when you start and stop speaking. It's like not 100%. So if you're having trouble with people talking over each other or not getting a word in edgewise, you know, you, you might prefer Zoom or Google Hangouts or Google Meet to Discord. I know Discord is a gamer favorite. I'm going to just look at a couple other challenges up here. It does require more prep work, Non. It, it really does. Um, but keep in mind that the technology allows you to be more responsive. I am a fly by the seat of my pants GM because freeform is largely what I do, right? So I kind of have tools available to help me with that when the players go off in a completely wild direction as they often do. So remember, like, Google is always accessible and, you know, use it. Um, that should help also. Speaking and everyone talking. Yeah, so I have a friend, Keith, that's a great uh, challenge. Thank you for bringing that up. When you have a bunch of assertive players, they are going to talk over each other on Zoom or whatever other platform you're using. And I know that's a big challenge. It's especially important to know if you have players who are socialized to not speak up or to let other people talk first. And as a woman in gaming, that's like a big deal for me. It, it took a while not only to learn how to be more assertive, but also to incorporate that into my GMing and make sure that everybody's kind of getting their say. First of all, I would limit how many players you have in the game. So I started running LARPs online with 10 people. It's a little much. Now I found the sweet spot is five to six people per session or campaign because everybody gets a turn. And as a GM, you're also a facilitator. You can't think of yourself as only the person managing the story you're also, again, managing your community. You're making sure everybody has a say. So if it's in like a LARP or a role play scene in a tabletop game where your guys are having a conversation, you can ask, you know, hey, um, you know, Zoltor, what do you think about this problem? How do you think we should handle it? You know, take advantage of that. And if you're running a LARP, try actually running uh, what I call sort of a GM less LARP where you're actually just role playing with them and guiding the story as your character. You don't have to be like this big controlling uh, GM when you're running a freeform LARP. So you can do that through your character agency. And of course you have to have the buy-in. But that should help you with people talking over. You can also uh, really just be honest with them and talk to them about how you want the game to run. Setting clear expectations is always really important for your community. And so when you set expectations about the kind of game you want to run, that can help. And that includes communication. Don't forget also in Zoom, you have this handy dandy chat. So when people are having any kind of issue or question, or if they don't feel like they're being able to be heard, you can have them message you and communicate with them that way. They can also use it as a function in-game to pass notes to each other. 
It's also a cool safety feature. If two of the characters are flirting a lot and maybe the players don't know each other well, or maybe it's getting really antagonistic, encourage them to use chat to talk to each other about that. So they can, you know, get permission to continue with that if they'd like to. I'm just looking through some more things here in the challenges. Players using computers with different operating systems and versions. That's certainly true, especially if you're getting into video game territory or more complicated tools. I play Civilization VI with my friend Erica and she streams it and what do you know? <clears throat> she's playing on a Mac and I'm playing on a PC and the updates don't always sync. Trolls, again, my advice there is keep it simple. Okay, everyone has purchased different D&D content in different platforms. Yes, Nick, that's also true. That's a toughie. Um, for the basic content, what most people do, if they know people have purchased, you know, a ton of D&D materials, um, obviously I can't recommend distributing copyrighted materials, but you can send everybody a, a link to the specific version you want them to, to buy to make sure they're on the same page. So again, that's managing your expectations there. And community management is important. Um, and we're going to move into that in just a second here. Challenges are large specific translating rules, buffer combat, etc. Aaron, that's certainly true. And I help people with that all the time. You can run role playing events and treat them as between game sessions. Um, you know, bot for combat, you can negotiate outcomes before play. Uh, but it is difficult when you have a rules heavy LARP and you're playing online. Um, I see setting difficulties. If you're running in a fantasy setting, guess what? Your video camera is now a magic mirror. Bam. You know, it's, it's, you have to work with what you have. You don't have the tech skills, the equipment. I know that's a challenge. That's, and that's what we're here to talk about, Natalie. Uh, Charlie says never run a game online before. Charlie, if that's the case, you know what I did the first time? I just ran a test. I just play tested it, had four people show up, four kind friends, and I ran it for them and they gave me feedback. And then I felt a lot more confident. So give that a try. I think we talked about most of it, um, money. So the only thing, Julie, that should really cost money if you already have a computer is going to be uh, a Zoom account if you feel that the need to get it. So I'm gonna go ahead and catch up on some messages here. 25 new messages, great chatty group. I'm not too good at improv, so a fair bit of planning, Brian, lean on your players that are good at improv. I, as a manager, as a GM, I have my strengths and my weaknesses, right? I don't like taking notes. I'm not the note taker. I'm never the secretary. I always make sure that job is assigned to somebody else in my LARPs, especially when I'm running multiple campaigns. So it's easy to keep track. Uh, Groups also keep OOC chat and side comments to chat. That helps as well. We'll get into streaming a little bit sooner or a little bit later. And cool. So we're gonna go on to community management and I saw flaky players were another problem, right? So we wanna address that. You need to build a community by harnessing your existing community. So you probably already have a group of friends, group of people you regularly play with. Even if it's four people, bam, you have a community. So I started my LARP community after LARPing for like 10 years. So I had a ton of Facebook connections that were LARPers. And I started with that and I was able to monetize pretty quickly because of that. Uh, but even if you're role playing in real life and it's not a pandemic, you wanna keep a lot of online communication going because you're keeping them engaged that way. You can also use Discord, 
or Facebook groups to do between game role play, allow for between game actions. But if you're big on the storytelling and the role play, do a lot of it there. Let them do that. Just because you're using Zoom most of the time doesn't mean you can't also have text based role play to keep your community active. My one of my biggest games is free. It's about the American Revolution. And it's mostly text based and then every couple weeks we do an online LARP and we have a tipping culture. So whoever's running the online portion, the LARP portion, we encourage tipping. So um, I use that free thing to draw people in. And then if they have the money and they want to play a different experience, I sell to them that way. But it's important to have that free and accessible community there if you're able to do that. You know, people, <coughs> excuse me, are shy the recalcitrant when you don't have a pandemic. So it does take a bit of a personality for you uh, as a GM and a community manager to do that, um, to kind of get them involved. And also, especially before the pandemic, there was a big perception that playing online, unless you're like, you got all the bells and whistles and you look like critical role, there was a the perception that playing online is not legitimate. And this is especially true in LARP because gosh, if you're not in person, how is it live action? Well, I don't know, like movies are in person, but they're still live action movies. There's still people doing things. Um, so, you know, I call them digital LARPs because it's the same thing as a, a LARP, like a parlor LARP, but it's happening online. So legitimizing online play has been something that a lot of us who run online have really been pushing for. But now that the pandemic has rolled around, it's being seen as more legitimate. But some people just, they're just not feeling it. And it's just not their thing. Just like, you know, they might like one setting or one system more than the other. Not, online play isn't for everyone. So don't force it. Um, and just recognize it might not be their preference. You can also prevent a lot of problems by setting very clear expectations about your setting, about the kind of content that's allowed. You can prevent a lot of problems, especially online, when you're dealing with people you don't know, by creating a list of topics that are not up for inclusion in your LARP. So I always make a Google Sheet and set it to edit and send it to my players and I put the topics I don't want to discuss in the game there and then let everybody else add to it. And then those topics are off limits. Your, your players are going to be more engaged and more immersed if they feel safe. So use safety tools. In online LARP, we use, or at least in my community, we use cut, which is cut and we do this, which is very similar to what you would have is hold in a buffer LARP, which stops play and then you talk about whatever you need to. A lot of people, <coughs> excuse me, also use red, yellow, green to kind of feel out where they are. The look down, which enables you to exit a scene and not be followed so you can temporarily walk away. And of course, communicating in chat is super important. Um, those are your big safety tools. And the more people feel comfortable, the more they're going to fully participate, the more they're going to take risks. I GM a game called uh, Bluebeard's Bride by Magpie Games. I run that for my community a lot. And that is a, it's pretty much femme horror. So whereas normally I'm like, we're never going to discuss rape or sexual assault. This game is all about dealing with things that we find terrifying about the experience of being a woman. And so by talking about all this before we play, we make sure we have a safe experience. And then as a GM, I can take more risks in describing some super gory stuff. And my players are taking more risks too. So that's big and important, especially if you're running any kind of serious game. I note a couple people talked about streaming. 
Um, there is a bit of a learning curve there. I have streamed some of my LARPs before, but I found that it distracted from my GMing and that more people wanted a private experience. But it can be fun to stream. <coughs> Excuse me. Most people stream on Twitch and most of them use OBS or open broadcasting software to stream. And you can capture Zoom and um, basically anything you have on a screen by using that. But again, it's like expanding the community you have to manage because then you have to manage everybody in chat in addition to everybody in the game. Uh, I would also recommend start by not streaming, get a pretty solid group together, and then decide to stream. And you know, if you're selling tickets, it's gonna be, it's actually, I found easier to monetize your game by not streaming it. At first I was like, I'm gonna have my regular LARPs on the stream. I was streaming like five times a week. It's like, I'm gonna get subscribers. People are gonna think this is cool. And they did think it was cool because I was the only person streaming LARP on Twitch. But I didn't really get subscribers because it takes effort to put into your Twitch community. Instead, I wanted to put that effort into my LARP community. And I found that by doing that, I was able to monetize better because I was able to sell more tickets. My customers are really, my community is really the LARPers, not Twitch. And once you get into streaming, you have to put in a full-time job's worth of effort to make it a full-time job. So that could be ideal during a pandemic, but for the most part, it's a lot of effort. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. You also need to think about disclaimers and legal stuff. Um, I have people agree to my code of content and, you know, this is my, my code of conduct rather. And this is important as soon as money changes hands, especially. I have them agree to the code of conduct and I have them watch a safety video. And on their character creation sheet, they have to check off that they agree to those and have watched them and read them. So that's really important. Your community management tools are also useful. Again, Discord, email list, Facebook groups. And if you're streaming, watch what other people do. You'll discover nowadays that more people are interested than role play, R-O-L-E play, than role play, R-O-L-L -L play. Thank you, Critical Role, for changing that culture. Um, however, because people watch Critical Role, they're going to expect that level of GMing from you if they don't know you. It's just a thing. Um, and so set expectations. John says the game language and framing is also different when streaming for an audience. It's totally true. And you're cognizant of the audience there. And if you're playing a game like Bluebeard's Bride or you're playing close to home or your players and your character, where your players are exploring part of themselves through their characters, they might be more hesitant to do that when they know there's an audience. So that's a very good point. So keep it simple to start. Again, I started just using Google Hangouts. Like, especially if you're nervous about running a game online for the first time, keep it simple, set expectations, tell them it's your first time running it, let them know, like pick people you trust. If you wanna monetize, again, it's easier to do it by selling tickets than it is by creating the big Twitch community uh, for most people. And uh, if you are selling tickets, check out Eventbrite. Even if you're not selling tickets, if you use Eventbrite and your event is free, then there's no fee to use Eventbrite, which is pretty cool. So it can really just help you manage the players who are showing up. Uh, it's just a good management tool and you can put all of your information on the event page. Eventbrite connects with something called Square, which is a payment processor. They take out a little fee and then they deposit it into your bank account. So Eventbrite is a good way to get started. I used to put my events on there. Now, because I already have a website using WordPress, I use the WooCommerce plugin. So things get instantly put into my PayPal accounts. PayPal, Venmo, those are also important tools to have. Even if you're not intent on running for monetization, it's always okay to ask for donations. Like when you go over to a friend's house and they're GMing, you know you, you should cover their pizza. 
or like bring snacks. That's just a polite thing to do if they're hosting. Same thing goes for online. Uh, it's always okay to ask for those donations, to put up a link for them to donate, PayPal, Venmo, whatever. Um, a lot of people are comfortable using Coffee or Ko-Fi. It's K-O-F-I. And that's because you're asking people just to buy you a cup of coffee. So the donations are in $3 amounts. So it's like, it makes it more acceptable for someone to literally just give you three bucks. And if you are making a significant amount of money, uh, remember to import, report your income to the IRS. I make enough money on this where I have to keep track of everything and report it in. Uh, that's important. The IRS always wants their cut or your tax authority if you live in another country. Um, John says, we've been having different people pay for Discord, some of the Roll20 rule books. It's kind of like donations. Yeah, that's great. When your community pitches it in and buys different resources, that's useful. And again, that's all about communicating within the group. And that's really cool. I love that your group does that. That's fantastic. Some people also trouble getting players. They have some marketing challenges, as I'd call it. And again, you can overcome those challenges by expressing the tone of your game. As somebody who runs digital LARP, people are like, what is that? What does it look like? So I have videos out so I can just show them because a lot of people don't get it until they see it. Um, you want to cover the content the triggers or the topics covered. Again, um, I run Blue Ridge Bride. That is not for everybody. That covers some serious stuff. Um, if somebody's looking for something more lighthearted, I tell them about a different game I have that might suit their needs. Not every game is for every player, and not every player is for every game. And, and that's okay. You know, it's tough when you want to play a game and you discover it might not be for you. But it's better to find out before you sign up. And the way to do that and to deter players who might not be a good fit for your game is to very clearly disclose what your game is about and what kind of tone you're going for. Inclusivity. Um, if you're streaming your game and your stream is getting bigger, um, or you just want kind of a richer gaming experience and your game is like five white dudes, consider maybe including somebody else and consider making sure that they have enough space there. And do some outreach. You have to like explicitly say that you're aiming for an inclusive game if you want to include other people. Being a woman, I don't have difficulty getting women to play my games. In fact, most of my games have more women uh, than any other gender, but uh, I'm white, right? So when I want to include players of color, I have to make a specific invitation and say, you know, you're welcome here. Because if a player of color is watching me play or looking at the people who are signing up for my games and they're all white, why would they feel included? So I have to like explicitly state that in my mission statement and my description of the game. And I have to extend personal invitations without making people feel pressured to spend money. Develop an elevator pitch, just like you would if you're selling a product. I run Chariot LARP. It is an immersive live action sci-fi experience for uh, multiple players. And it utilizes the real life technology in game. There's an elevator pitch. Personal branding, what are you good at as a GM? What are you known for? Uh, definitely know what you're good at and capitalize on it. I'm great at on the fly GMing. I'm great at storytelling. I'm great at creating communities that are inclusive and I'm known for that. So when people are looking for that type of game, they come to me. People are saying, who runs digital arts? That comes to me. When you Google digital arts, that comes to me. Uh, I have worked really hard on that personal branding. And if you're serious about GMing, especially professionally, you should do that too. Above all, be yourself. That's what people really like. It's, it's tough because there are a lot of expectations out there. And as much as I love 
big streams. Um, it's created a lot of pressure for GMs. And really, especially your friends, they just want you to be you. They want to have a good experience. They want to hang out. So be yourself. Get feedback. They're going to be strong on weak points you have. I'm really, really bad at mechanics. Like, so bad at mechanics. I hire other people to create character sheets when there's mechanics in the game. So, you know, I know that's my weak point. But I'm also probably one of the better storytellers you're ever going to find in an online LARP environment. So you, you have your strong weak points and know what they are and you're transparent about them. Especially if you're taking money and doing this professionally, don't take it personally and always go back and re-engage your viewer base or your player base and ask them about it. And I see some more comments in here. I'm going to get to because we do have some, some time left. Um, Keys asks, do you prefer using video? The other issue I've had is transitioning to online. I don't want to, to force everyone to use video. Yeah, you know, you do see those social cues, hand gestures, facial expressions. Um, I always encourage video, but if somebody really has like a problem with being on screen, I, you know, let them use voice. If you're not streaming, it's a little bit easier. People are feeling more comfortable if they know they're not being like recorded and stuff. But, you know, some people just, it's just not their thing, you know, and, and that's okay too. But I try to get people who are comfy using video. I also, at the beginning of my games, always remind people about the functions on Zoom that they can mute or stop their video. Uh, you know, I role play four hours at a time and the number one people, the number one reason people have to step away is to either get a drink of water or to pee. Like, I don't want to make people sit there and be uncomfortable and coughing or like, you know, have to use the bathroom. I encourage them to turn off their microphone to say BRB and to go use the bathroom. You know, like when they know that they're not stuck in the chair and have to be like obsessively paying attention every single moment. You know, they, they feel a little more comfortable with video. Again, utilize your session zero or even offer to have a one-on-one -on -one video chat if people are maybe having issues with video because they're not used to it or not comfortable with it. That's another one. So like at my day job, we almost always do voice only, even though everything we use is video capable. It's probably because most of us work in our pajamas, right? Because uh, we all work at home. But it's just very interesting when you're not seeing those cues, especially when you're talking about subjects like marketing that involve a lot of storytelling, you do miss things. And, and I feel that at my day job. So when I am doing my night job, which is uh, running LARPs online, I try to be able to see that and I try to be able to communicate that as well. Um, so quality over quantity, that's also true. And that's especially for people who are professionally doing this. That's also true when you're running games. When I started running Chariot, I had five simultaneous campaign uh, runs. So every game, it was four hours each session and five sessions per run for $50. That's how I started. And each one had about six or seven people in it. And there were five of them. And I was running it like in a continuity universe. So I was running it like Buffy and Angel, like Buffy would do something. And then, you know, Angel's show would have a response and then vice versa. Uh, and I, ha I hired other GMs and we were like even role playing at the same time. That was freaking cool. But I burned out. Fortunately, that was my full time job at the time. But you got to manage what you're doing, especially as you become popular and known. Uh, at this point, we have a little less than 10 minutes left. I would like to welcome any other comments or questions. Um, I know I focused mostly on tabletop, so if people want to know how to do LARPs and stuff like that, um, you can ask me that as well. But I definitely want to cover any other questions you may have. or comments or other advice you want to give people. Any further resources and links for LARP base?
for LARP based. Yeah, um, there is a gaming group on Facebook. Let me find it. I admin it. Um, it's about, in fact, if you look up, I think it's just under digital LARP. Yeah, if you look up digital LARP, on Facebook, you'll find a group called Remote Digital LARPs and Live Action Online Games. That's the big place to ask questions. I'm one of the admins. It's got like 500 people in it. You'll also find my community, the Geek Initiative LARP and Gaming Community, and we're happy to help you get started too. Um, the big thing for LARPs is communicating what it's like on there. So let's see, audio recommendations. Yes, thank you for asking the, for answering those music questions because that is not my area of expertise. Plate mail games and Serenscape. Yeah, and also Aaron, if you Google digital LARP, you'll find me. Um, people LARPing online also call them LAUGS, L-A-O-G. A fantastic German gentleman, my friend Garrett, invented that term. And if you look for Laug, you'll find his work and groups. Do you do a map of digital handouts and picture examples? Yeah, you can do that. You don't have to, but yeah. Um, I appreciate resource sharing, uh, online boards, Schmeppy. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. Julie, thank you for participating. I appreciate it. I appreciate those recommendations. Somebody saying Schmeppy is good for that. Thank you, Kevin, for that resource. Fantastic. Well, it seems like we've covered just about everything. Uh, you can find me at the Geek Initiative LARPs if you just Google that, geekinitiative.com, larpmentor.com if you need help uh, translating your game into an online environment, and chariotlarp.com if you're interested in trying a digital LARP experience at the end of August. Thank you again so much. Again, I'm Tara Clapper, and I appreciate your participation and also all of your suggestions. I hope you have a great rest of your convention. Thank you.